evening, everyone. It's the second escapist communicast that deals with sexism. And today we deal with a rather serious topic. We don't deal with sexism only in video games, but with sexism in real life. With me are Darken. Hello. Evil Smurf. I'm so tired, but I'm here. And of course, Lilani. And I'm here with a good connection this time. So lots of changes this time around. And another change is that we actually have a list of topics to discuss, so we'll have some kind of structure. And that said, I think we best start right now with, you know, a discussion about MRA and feminism in general. Are they positive driving forces for our society? And, you know, there are very common misconceptions about feminists just being feminazis who, uh, I don't know, want to kill all men or enslave them or castrate all of them or just take video games away from us and about how MRAs are all rape supporters and misogynists. And there are terms thrown around like patriarchy and privilege without ever really being explained. So I think we should get behind that. I think we should even start with, you know, patriarch and privilege. I mean, we all hear these t words a lot when the subject comes up, but we never really explain them. We never really bother to ask what they mean because we just all we all just assume that everyone knows what they mean. So why don't we start with the patriarchy? What does a patriarchy even mean? What do you think the patriarchy means? Well, isn't um a patriarch a male head of a household, or I suppose society? Yeah, that's the textbook definition of it. I actually pulled up the definition here. A form of social organization in which the father is the supreme authority in a family, clan, or tribe, and descent is reckoned on the male line. That's a pretty good definition. Uh, I'd just like to point out that uh, the word patriarchy uh, now has a different meaning, and I would like to compare it with the word aristocracy, which used to be a form of government to but uh, obviously now we have different forms of government and however uh, we still have aristocrats, we still have rich people with power and I think that's the definition of patriarchy that we're using nowadays uh, about the power that men still have in society. Yeah, that's the way I see it thrown around, like especially online is this whole idea that there's this giant conspiracy against women, like to suppress women. And I kind of feel like it's a misuse of the term. Like, yeah, society still favors men, but it's not as though it's a conspiracy. It's just the way society is shaped and certain things that we keep doing that kind of keep it shaped that way. Yeah, like men, men still have power because, because people have power and women have power as well. Well, yes, uh, there, I don't think there is an actual conspiracy, but uh, the fact is that, in general, uh, over 90% of the richest and most powerful people are men, so they get to shape, uh, directly or indirectly, the world. And that, uh, that has an effect, because they will tend to favor other men, and they will... Uh, they will use their power to keep their power and to maintain the way that things have been in general. But isn't that more of a plutocracy then? Because if you assume the patriarchy means that all men or men generally have power, if we say that the power comes from being rich and already possessing influence and be becoming rich, making you influential, it sounds more like a plutocracy, to be honest. A male-focused one, of course, because very many m males, very many rich people are male after all, and being rich apparently is a source of power. But is patriarchy the correct term to use here? Not in that case. I feel like it may have once been, because for a long time, like back, especially in the 18th and 19th century, everything was focused on men. Like there was a systematic uh, keeping, wo uh, keeping women out of society and out of property ownership. But now I think I think this the effects of that still exist, but I think it is fading away. And like you said, I think probably a better definition of it now would just be plutocracy, because it's kind of just feeding itself. Like the people with the most influence are men, so they're the ones who gain the most influence and money, and it just keeps inheriting from there. But in Australia, we have um, a female prime minister, for example. 
and I have a female president too, but uh, I still see a lot of sexism in my daily life. So, not it's not always a good uh, measuring tool. So should we, you know, try to expand a bit because now we just focus the patriarchy on political power and influence over, you know, government. Is patriarchy more than that? Because as we said, patriarchy or the ending archy always implies ruling. So maybe should we expand this to a broader definition? Yes, that's why I brought up the aristocracy because, uh, you know, they don't have political power. Sometimes they do, but... Uh, they have social power too. Everyone looks up to them, and uh, they they can make things happen. And in a way, uh, men can too. Especially when, uh, for example, up until recently, uh, women weren't allowed in uh, in the military, for example, and that still gives uh, a, an advantage to men in terms of uh, when people are. Uh, there's uh, in countries with a military warship or when uh, soldiers get a lot of recognition when only men get that recognition that is a power that men have that women don't for example but then again in especially if it comes to military service the term privilege comes up a lot because the defense against this accusation is that women weren't allowed in the military because of their privilege, because they were to be protected from harm and the man had to go die for their protection. Um, I say that women have always been uh, in parts of war, but usually as civilians and uh, you know that they, they are still uh, victims of war and they have always been a part of it. So that bit about keeping them away from harm is just not true. It still happens. So uh, I think that uh, it's not a privilege when, uh, we, when the soldier is elevated as a positive force. Like when someone says, oh, he's a soldier and he deserves respect, that is something that, uh, that it's a privilege, I, I would say. Okay, but consider this. Um, the soldier has a greater chance of dying. Whereas women, if they're at home or doing things that they regularly do, like going to uni, uh, shopping, you know, smoking, everything that... Oh, that sounds horrible. But assuming they're acting like regular people and they're not fighting, then they're not going to die. I think that's a good trade-off. You know, I kind of feel like it should be equalized because in the U.S. with the draft, like they haven't done the draft since the Vietnam War, and I really doubt they won't ever do it again just for political reasons. But it still exists, and men when they turn eighteen still have to register for the draft, but women don't. And now that women are allowed into combat roles, I kind of feel like that's a really big discrepancy now that needs to be evened out. But I kind of feel like politicians aren't touching it just because no one wants to touch the draft at all. Like, no one even wants to think about doing the draft ever again. So there's kind of political things that are keeping those things from evening out, at least in the US. I agree. I think that uh, these things should be even out because that's something that is still used as an argument against women. Like, they're, they're told, well, you don't have to be in the draft. And a lot of feminists say, well, we should be in the draft. And I agree with them. I think that uh, things should be equalized and things are never going to be people are never going to take uh, they're, not, they're never going to see both genders as equal until the, the, the same conditions are applied equally to both of them and this is a great example yeah I agree with that as well I think women should also have to sign up for the draft like if they're going to keep the draft at all and if they're going to have women in combat roles then that needs to be equalized yeah equality and all that. I agree as well. If we allow women in combat roles, we should also have them sign up to, you know, be eligible for drafting. So that way they get both the recognition, the possible recognition of being a soldier, but also the possible danger of being drafted, which, to be honest, we don't really face nowadays anymore because drafting is rarely done, if ever. I don't think that in the US 
anyone will be ever be drafted anytime soon. But I think that is something that's actually, actually it's something we hear about a lot on the internet, that feminists apparently, it's a very common misconception, that feminists want all the positive things they want, you know, all the possibilities that men have without any of the responsibility. Which brings us, of course, to our next topic, common misconceptions about feminism, about MRAs, about the term privilege, about the term patriarchy, about everything this entails. Now, one of the most common misconceptions is that all wh- that the term patriarchy and privilege in relation to white men is referring to the fact that all white men everywhere have a certain inherent power that all of them are were, uh, that all of them are part of a secret i don't know society or conspiracy to rule this earth and I do not think that this is entirely accurate. Uh, what what are you talking about? Didn't you go to the um to the meeting? <laughs> I don't feel like there's like a big conspiracy going on, but I think there is some merit to the idea that, like, if a black person walks into a store, then they're going to get looked at a little more suspiciously suspiciously than a white person, or especially like a group of them. If a group between a group of white people and a group of black people, that's just sort of how people react. So I think there is sort of still some merit to that idea. But it's not like a conspiracy. It's just kind of people's initial reactions and how people act as a group. There's there's advantages and disadvantages of being a man and a woman. Like, women have... I'm generalizing here. But women... But people will um, objectify women. And as a result of that, they will get things like free drinks and free stuff. Whereas men typically have to pay for that. But the advantage of being a man, I guess we don't get pregnant. I mean, we definitely don't get pregnant. I'm not being iffy on that. We don't get pregnant at all. Yeah, and then there's that quote, I think it's from Mean Girls, like the way men and women, well, or male sexuality and female sexuality is viewed. Um, it's something like a key... A key that can open any lock is a master key, but a lock that can be opened by any key is just a shitty lock. So just sort of how the way, if a woman is really sexually active, she's a slut. But if a man is really sexually active, then he's a stud. He can get the ladies and he's awesome. But who doesn't, who doesn't like, um, again, this might sound wrong, but who doesn't like, you know, women who are open to things? Not to say that I'm a man slut or anything, but shouldn't we respect people even if they do sleep around? I think we should, I mean, yeah, they're regardless. More fun. But I think women are more prone to criticism, typically, on the subject. Like, typical female um, insults are like whore, and they have to do with how women have sex. Like, male male insults as well kind of include cock and dick, but that's just referring to the sexual part, not actual, not their sexuality and their sexual habits. Whereas calling someone a... Whereas calling someone... A cunt, for example, yeah, I, is I think not that, that? Um, these differences, um, they are technically called benevolent sexism. And all these things that like chivalry and free drinks and all that stuff, it's, it looks good on, on a surface level. But uh, they always have this undertone of sexism, like chivalry, uh, it implies that the woman is weak and she can't do anything on her own. And the free drinks and the like have the expectation that uh, that a woman is something that you can purchase. Like if you buy her a drink, she will uh, have sex with you and the like. And the reason it's called benevolent sexism and not female privilege is because women didn't decide this. This was something that men said that w- women should work like. Like chivalry wasn't something that women said, okay, you're gonna open doors for us and all that. It's something that men did because they thought women uh, couldn't handle on their own or uh, thought it, saw it as their responsibility. And I think that's a common misconception when people say, oh, women have privilege too. Uh, no, it's not privilege if you didn't choose that. I open the door for everyone. Yeah, me too. And like with the paying for stuff, I got a boyfriend a couple months ago and that's something I was just like trying to actively do, like make sure 
that whenever we go to a movie or get food or something, we all, I always try to split it 50, 50 or like if he pays one time, then I'll pay the next time and be sure to remember just sort of making sure that evens out. <laughs> yeah. That's how it should be because that's how equitable relationships work. Like I open the door for everyone too, because I, I don't want to make this distinctions. Um, but what I'm saying is that there's, that there's a difference uh, between privilege and just a benevolent form of sexism. Uh, at, at, I'm speaking about common misconceptions, that sort of thing. Yeah, but we're not talking about real life though, are we? We're what well, we are. But this is talking about the controversy uh, struck up by the internet. People will frenzy like sharks to chum. Because the internet loves a fight, and that's all, okay, that's mostly what it is. It's true, the internet really does love fighting, that I, I, I can attest to that. Yeah, and I think that's where we get all these misconceptions on, like, what patriarchy is, and, like, every side trying to up the ante, so, like, the really hyper-feminist side saying that there's this giant conspiracy, and then on the other side, them saying that there's a feminist conspiracy with the feminazis. It's just everyone trying to up the ante to make the other side look worse. And it's really not helping anybody at all. This, of course, is a great way to, you know, segue into our next topic, which is MRA versus feminism. Should these, I mean, these are two very different movements. Should we, should we really see it as a war or shouldn't they just work hand in hand? Because the way I see it, feminism and M men's right activists both work towards the same goal, which is to equalize the genders. At least that's what they do, according to their own statements and theories. And according to themselves, they work towards creating an equal society. So why is it they like to fight that much? Why don't they work together to, you know, figure something out? Because there are, of course, there are uh, there is sexism against men. If, especially when it comes to, for example, custody. And there is sexism against women still, again, of course, when it comes to promotions, for example. So why do these two movements, why don't the activists don't unite? I think it is an interesting relationship because they are working towards the same goal. And I can't think of any other two organizations that do that sort of thing. Like, you don't have cancer organizations trying to wage war against, like, homeless shelters. <laughs> Like, they're not trying to steal from each other. So it is just kind of an interesting relationship between the two. If I could draw a... If I could draw a, um, a comparison with religion, and of course it's different, but it's the way you see an issue. Um, and, and so if you perceive one side to see it differently than you... Then you will have, like, a prejudice to, to sort of correct them. Like, you, I like you, but you're kind of wrong about this. And uh, yeah. if you mix the internet fury with that, it's like, I hate you, you're wrong, go die. Well, I think that there's a lot of blame, and I think that's the reason they don't work together. Like, for example, in feminist theory, uh the patriarchy and all that, in, it tends to uh, it tends to be perceived as blaming men for problems. And a lot of MRAs do the same thing with women. They blame women for their problems. And as long as each side is blaming the other, they're never going to work together because they're going to say, you are the reason why I have these problems. And that's why I think that um, the best uh, position to take is to say, okay, uh, let's blame everyone equally. We're all part of this. We're all partially to blame. And you accept responsibility for the problems that you want to fix. And that way you can work with someone else because they are accepting blame too. And I think that's that's the best way that you can bridge this divide between feminists and MRAs. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like, I can see I can see all the problems that women have, and I can also see, like, there's a big problem with men, like, not only with custody, but with um, also childcare jobs. Like, in the U.S., a lot of men 
are not trusted to do childcare jobs because of the scare for pedophilia. And as far as I know, yeah. pedophilia... That's why I... Um, with both genders. <laughs> that's why I... Well, that, I, I didn't get a placement in a childcare centre because I'm a male. And um, I, yeah, and I didn't right pass my all. course because I'm a male. Ugh. Yeah, and actually, uh, here in my country, uh, we uh, just recently had a female teacher that molested her students. So uh, this definitely happens in both genders. Maybe that there's a disparity in in terms of statistics, but it uh, it it has the capacity. I mean, both genders have the capacity to to molest, and it is a terrible thing. But you're not gonna solve it by with discrimination. Yeah, and that's something that really disgusts me when those stories come out that say, you know, twenty year old teacher has sex with a a female teacher has sex with a like ten year old boy. Like all the responses you'll see to that are, Oh, he scored, you know, he got a great he did really great with that. If the genders were reversed, that would be a terrible thing. And I can't help but feel like that's not just the internet. I feel like like male rape and um if it's a woman raping a boy, neither of those are taken as seriously as they should be. Which is a problem with both genders. That should rape should never be not taken seriously, no matter who it happens to. And I I couldn't possibly agree more. And uh, but the problem that's actually one of the problems that uh, I think MRAs want to address. The 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 one of the main issues I think with them is that uh, men uh, are are not seen as uh, rape victims or abuse victims. Oh, especially when the perpetrator is a woman and that's something they want to correct and that's something that a lot of feminists sympathize with but uh, because of these wars and these divides they tend not to work together you know because of all the things we've said before and they should because it, it, it will eventually benefit both genders in the end if we treat all rape equally and all rapists equally is it because we don't is it because to make it a little bit nicer when we think about it we don't see it as rape on the news like say a 20 year old female teacher uh, assaults a 10 year old like in the back of your mind if you um if you're trying to play it nicely i guess you're thinking what would you do in this situation you're like okay i'm roughly her age it's just kind of cute that's probably what it is, kind of projection. Oh, I think I can see that, maybe. It's an idea, anyway. That, that could happen, uh, that could be the case, but uh, that also touches on something that feminists get a lot of flag of, which is the term uh, rape culture, which is something that uh, it's known to spark flame wars everywhere. And it's this, uh, it's a theory about how society, or at least Western society, sees rape. And part of it is the idea that men uh, can't be raped, but uh, a man can't be raped by a woman. And this, uh, this particular example, that if the woman is hot, then it's not rape, and that sort, of, that sort of thing. Do people think that, actually? Do people actually think men can't be raped, or is that a thing people say? To to um to put women down or feminists down is that real? Uh, yes, that's something that uh, it's studied in feminist theory, the the term rape culture, and it's more of a, a theory on itself about how society, different ways society addresses rape, and it obviously points out the things where society is more uh, screwed up, like. The idea that a prostitute can't be raped, or that uh, that it, uh, like we said, it doesn't count if it's a woman raping a man. All those those issues, like for example, what a woman was wearing, or telling a woman that if she was uh, wearing uh, slutty clothes, then it was her fault. Uh, those things are all uh, part of rape uh, rape culture, and it it tends to to uh, create a lot of flames because. It's really shocking to people, I think, the idea that, that we as a society have a terrible view of rape, despite the fact that it's a very serious issue, and I think that's what 
rankles people. Yeah, and I don't know anyone, I personally don't know anyone who believes that men can't be raped by women, but I do know a lot of people who feel um, terrible things about prison rape, about how, like, prisoners deserve, certain prisoners deserve to be raped, and, like, that that is really not a good idea at all. Like, no part of the justice system should be getting raped. But so many people believe that there are situations where someone gets sent to prison and they get raped. Well, they had what was coming to them, like child molesters and stuff. Like, even as bad as their crimes were, it's not a healthy thing at all to believe that someone should be punished outside of what the justice system has decided for them. Yes, that's a great example of the things that, uh, that are screwed up. Like, that, that rape is something that is never okay. And people think that there are circumstances where it is okay. And that's, that's really screwed up. And yeah, that's part of one of the, 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 but that's part of the theory. And that's something that gets in a lot of people's nerves or makes them angry and like, because like, well, like you said, those people have uh, weird that or and not very nice ideas and it's not they don't like being told that you know that that they're part of the problem and of course this is the rape culture as such is a very common misconception as well it's thrown around a lot of, for example on the escapist in this in that post contributes to rape culture or someone contributes to rape culture by doing something which brings me to a question actually i have which is if I mean, humor should usually, even if it's very dark humor, is said to be exempt of all things, but there are jokes which are considered rape jokes because they make, they use rape for shock and derive humor from that. Are they part of rape culture or are they still okay as far as, you know, that goes? Uh, Why can't it be both? I mean, okay, if there's some comedians like, Sarah Silverman, for example, a uh, woman, obviously, um, and she makes jokes about Jews, uh, which aren't rapists, but uh, she'll make jokes like that'll tie that'll tie them together, like uh, I don't know, forty million Jews walking into a gas chamber. Uh, but did you see what they were wearing? Like something like that. Uh, while can be funny when when she says it, um, is funny when she says it, isn't, it would only offend you if that's what you cared about, and everyone has, and everyone can care about whatever they like, because, obviously. Well, I think that humour is one of those things that are very personal, and we all have uh, type of humor that we like and it's never exactly the same as someone else's and I think that criticizing humor is not a battle that you can win like you can never win a, uh, a battle about saying well this is funny this is not funny you should not joke about this or that because uh, people will always disagree and uh, people who uh, tell jokes will uh, will keep telling jokes but having said that I would personally never tell a rape joke and I do not like them and I, I would not laugh at them um, and I think that when a feminist says well uh, rape jokes make uh, make people who molest or whatever feel validated and I think they're right I think that uh, treating things with humor and like they're okay can make certain people feel like what they're doing is no big deal like if they're taking a drunk woman uh, to bed and all that and they think oh it's not a big deal we joke about it all the time and they're right it can lead that but at the same time uh, you're never gonna win a battle on humor you're never gonna be able to get people to say oh you shouldn't joke about this People will joke about everything, and well, that's my position on the subject. Yeah, and I think people who are looking for validation, they would find it, uh, regardless of whether or not there was humor. Like they're going to do what they're going to do, and they're going to find validation regardless. And like you all said, I kind of feel like humor is very, very situational. 
and oh, shoot, there was something else I was gonna say. <laughs> uh, just go ahead, I'll think of it. Okay, but uh, jokes. I'd say that's rape jokes are said in irony because no one actually who's going to make a rape. Okay, maybe, but comedians who are making rape jokes aren't rapists. They're comedians, so they're saying yeah. it in irony. And I just remember the other thing I was going to say, where I draw the line is personally putting people down. A while back, there was a situation with Tosh.0 where he was doing like a, the Tosh guy, he was doing a stand-up thing and he told a female heckler that, you know, to go get gang raped. And people were like, oh, he said it to be funny. He, it was really funny and everything. And like, that may have been funny as a joke out of context, but if you're personally saying that to an individual... That is messed up. That's not comedy. That is putting someone down, and that is wishing them to be raped. There's no, there's nothing funny about that. Yeah, like it. it that's I. I personally don't see what's so funny about that. Like, I mean, I. I thought it would be actually be funny if you just said, "Well, fuck you," uh, instead of that. It, it, it's like you, you convey the same message, and you don't. You don't like you say. You don't wish them harm. Especially not like that. I mean, I would have found it funny if, if he had said like, "Well, go trip on a brick and fall on your face." And that, that might have been funny, but uh, not not go get gang raped. That that's just not. I don't see the humor in that personally. Well, first of all, I don't know the exact situation because I haven't seen the videos of the incident. But of course, it is tradition to put down hecklers personally. In a com if a stand-up comedian is being heckled, he will put down the individual in question. And I, but this said, I don't agree with the method he used and he employed for this because, well, implying that someone should get raped really isn't that funny. I have to admit, I made or I still make rape jokes from time to time, which are very dark in humor, of course. And I only use them when I know that the people won't be offended by them, because I know that they are very offensive, of course. But I can still laugh at them, though the subject matter of rape is a serious one, because I am just that kind of person. That said, I don't think that it was a very appropriate way to put down this specific heckler, even if he tried to go for shock humor. But we already have more than half an hour on the podcast, so I'd say we should switch to the next topic which, according to my list, is the reproductive rights of both men and women, which is, of course, a very important topic. Because, as we all know, there is the problem that when a man fathers a baby, he has to pay for that baby. And you, it's quite common, apparently, that men opt out of that... Uh, opt out of that and just disappear and never contact the mother again, never pay anything. And then, of course, there is the other side of that, that women have an abortion without first asking the father, without even talking to the father about it, which gets MRAs angry because they say that they have a right to their child, whilst feminists argue that the, it's the mother's body. So what is your stance on this? I have an interesting stance. Um, um, uh, hang on, what was the first question? What was the first bit of that? The first bit was, of course, that men are usually accused of, you know, just ditching the mother with a baby and making a run for it. But at the same time, women are usually... It's said that women abort the baby without even asking the father, without having to talk to the father about this decision, which gets MRAs in arms. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I... I think that... Well... Men and women can be deadbeat parents, and either side should pay, both both sides should support the child, both. If one leaves, and they should still support the child. And controversially, I I think I don't agree with abortion at all, and I don't think anyone should do that. Which kind of makes me e equal in this, I guess. I. I don't think either side, either side should have a right in it. Well, I, I am pro-choice, but uh, regarding the the bit about the deadbeat parents, something that a lot of people forget is that taking care of a child is a job, and when the mother is left with the child, she has a new job basically, 
And when, for example, when you have a babysitter or you pay childcare, you are paying someone to take care of a child. And when the mother does it, that's still a job. And she, like the father, she's contributing money to the child. But in, in her case, that money is in the form of labor, of, of hours spent looking after the child. So what the father is doing is the same thing that the mother is doing. Only he has the right to just write a check while the mother is the one who has to actually spend the time and put on the, the labor. And a lot of people also say, well, she could just give it up for adoption. And that's true. But at the same time, there is still a lot of social uh, negativity against the women who put the child up for adoption. Uh, they are seen as... Because women are still under the under the the pressure to be child uh, caretakers and a woman who abandons her child even if she gives it up for adoption is still seen as having failed quote unquote of course uh, as a woman and that's that's a price that all women want to pay and I completely stand by it yeah uh, until we see well, a change in social uh, expectation and a woman can give up her child for, a, for adoption safely without suffering social repercussions. I don't think men have a lot of, of ground to complain when it comes to child support. I'm not really sure how it is in other countries, but in the U.S., I think that perception that women must take care of the child, I think that's starting to fade away. There's still a few problems with, like, there being no paternity leave and women just always being expected to take care of the child after it's born, but I think that's sort of slowly solving itself. And like you said, I do. You don't have paternity that, leave. Um, as far as I know, it's it's not required by the government. I don't think. I think certain companies might have it, like maybe big big corporations. But as far as I know, it's not a widespread thing, and it's not very much used or discussed. Thank God I don't live in America. Yeah, and it's. Uh, like I said, it's definitely not something that I've heard of used much. I've never heard of any guy going on paternity leave. Like, it's always the woman goes on pater on maternity leave, she has the baby, she takes care of it, and then she comes back. I don't think I've ever heard of a man in my area or any area around that's taken off to take care of the child while the woman has continued to work. My chemistry teacher did that, uh, to be honest. He left us for two months to take care of his infant son then. And his wife, of course, took uh, maternity leave, I think, before or after that, so they both took their leave, basically un basically paid vacation time to t look after the child in my area. But what I, what I was going to say is that I was going to play a bit of devil's advocate again and do go for an MRA viewpoint, which is that, of course... Oh, so men of the uh, devil. I see what you're going with. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay, there, uh, there is, of course, the position that men will are still, you know treated unfairly when it comes to child custody. The woman will always be favored in by the court, or usually be favored by the court, over the father, even if the father might be the more suitable parent to get full custody of the child. Which is something that I believe is actually worth, you know, discussing as well. Yeah, in the US, this is definitely true. Like, it's funny, because about 100 years ago, it was the opposite. Men... Because women didn't have jobs, men would be given the baby. But now it's flipped around, and women are favored so much. There's actually a TV show called The Deadliest Catch. It follows these men, like mostly men, who go out and fish for crab in Alaska. And one of these guys was having a child custody battle while the show was going on. And he ended up losing custody of his children because the woman, the mother, told the judge that she was afraid he was going to run off with the kids to Mexico. Because apparently he was from Mexico at some point. He didn't have any sort of accent. But he's a crab fisherman who works in Alaska on a TV show. And she's afraid he's going to go run off to Mexico. That's insane. But the, the judge still took her side of the story and still awarded her custody of the kids and took away all of his custody. So there is definitely a discrepancy in the U.S. when it comes to um, custody. Yeah, clearly he had crabs. He had no... Okay, that's an awful joke. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I agree. I agree with, with Lilani that... Um, uh, women do get favored but that's actually not a good thing because 
like I said, that's part of the expectation that the woman is going to just naturally take care of the child. And uh, sometimes uh, it actually backfires and, for example, the father just takes off and leaves and it's assumed that the mother will take care of it. And, uh, well, this is the flip side where uh, men get uh, the short end of the stick. Uh, but it's part of, same, of the same root, the same root that sees women as uh, ch uh, child caretakers. Yeah, and like, it was just a ridiculous situation, and she just took advantage of it in order to take away his custody. So it's not only giving him the short end of the stick, but he literally was not able to see his children just because she didn't want to deal with them. So she just told the judge what she wanted, and she got what she wanted because she's the woman. And nowadays it's kind of flipped, and everyone thinks the mother is always right, when that's just simply not always the case. I've worked in child care, and it's, and it's really hard. I mean, it's... It's an emotional drain. It's like, at the end of the day, uh, you're like, oh, I really need a hug, and I just want to sleep. Because it's like, the child, the, the children are like, me, 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 and it's adorable and cute, like, children, I guess, and it's quite hard. I think anyone... And you really need the best candidate to, who can do that sort of thing. And maybe I wasn't cut out for it because I am not doing that course anymore. But um, but anyone who can do that, well, I think should get the the child. It's more it's more an indictment of the court system, uh, rather than people, because. Uh, because like a, like you and I, and them, they will, they will um, have a reasonable opinion of, okay, well can you actually support this child? No, well, this guy can. Or this girl can, sort of thing. It's it's an indictment of the courts, not people. Yeah, and I think the exactly. reason they do favor women is because I think the court is just afraid that they're going to get some terrible backlash. Like, oh no, you took a child away from its mother and gave it to the father instead. Like, there's just, there's this bad, still a bad image of taking a child away from the mother, even if the mother is unsuited. Just out of context, people still take that so much more terribly than they would take, oh, a child's taken away from the father. Which is actually a great way to segue into our next topic. It's about, about the influence sex has on your... Hmm? You, which is how... Oh, I said I'm glad I could provide all your segues. <laughs> yes, of course. It's about the, it's the influence your sex has in your career chances. I mean, Evil Smurf touched on that before when he told us that he actually had to quit uh, childcare because he was male, or because he is male, rather. And this, of course, this is a topic worth discussing as well. If your sex still influences your career chances... And if uh, there should be a gen gender quota enforced by law for certain positions or certain jobs. I think gender quotas are a terrible idea. It just completely uproots the whole idea of equality. Like, there's always going to be a few discrepancies. Like, there's always going to be more male firefighters and more, like, male construction workers just because they tend to be more qualified or they tend to just go to those more. It's a prop it's a matter of making sure that everyone has equality of opportunity, not that there are people being forced in and out of jobs because of their gender. Hmm. It's it's like numbers should not be enforced. What should happen is if some stupid cow says, I don't like that guy. He looks shifty then they should look at that guy's track record. Yeah. That's what that's what should happen. People should look at results, not hunches. That's prejudice, and it's terrible in any form. Yeah, uh, I actually agree that I think gender quotas are at, uh, they may be a temporary solution for like jobs where they're like 100% men or 100% women, but it doesn't work in the long run. It, it, on the contrary, it tends to create resentment and it tends to for example when when uh, supported by feminists it tends to give the other side the anti-feminists 
uh, leverage against this because they say like oh feminists want to control everything they want to enforce quotas and they want to force men out of the jobs and they're evil and I think that it tends that it tends to harm do more harm than good in the long run and I say this as someone in a in a profession that has about 90 95 percent women uh, so uh, I know I know what it's like to to be in a in a in a profession that is almost completely dominated by the other gender, and uh, but I I also wouldn't want a quota because I would also feel like I haven't earned the the position and I would be treated as though I hadn't earned the position. I would be treated as uh, someone who just got in because of the quote, and it tends to and to reinforce the idea that this gender or that gender doesn't deserve to be here and it's going to it's not going to get the respect or it's not going to convince the gender that was already there that this change is for good if you know if you understand what I'm talking about yeah and as far as like other forms of discrimination the biggest one I know of that's against women is with maternity leave, like women not being given promotions to higher positions because certain employers may see them as ticking time bombs as women somewhere in their 30s that, oh, they might turn up pregnant at any point and she'll need maternity leave and she won't be able to do this big project. And I think that sort of preemptive not promoting people is something that needs to be addressed. Like I understand companies need to operate very efficiently, but if you and you can't just ask people, well, do you plan to get pregnant within the next two years? Like, but it's just a risk they have to take. And if if in the U.S. we would encourage paternity leave more, that could help alleviate that. Like, yeah, the woman's got to have the baby, but if we sort of equalize it out and have more, you know, make guys able to do it too, and not so discourage them, that could help even that out and make it operate more efficiently. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that would be a, a great idea. And the other thing that kind of bothers me is like, is the reason we need quotas in some things is because like maybe in the maths and the sciences and everything, there's not as many women. And if you look at why, like this is sort of going into uh, child rearing instead of uh, career stuff. But if you look at toys that are typical of girls and toys that are typical of boys, boy toys are like Legos and connects and stuff that you build and sort of use your creativity with. And girls' toys tend to be, like, cooking things and dressing things up and more uh, domestic toys. So it kind of makes sense to me that more boys are favoring engineering when their toys tend to favor engineering stuff. I, 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 can, well, I, I kind of agree. Like, not with physical toys. Maybe you're right there. Um, but there's a website, uh, Games for Girls. Uh, which you probably don't go on because you don't do look up that. <laughs> but um, it's pink. It has horrible, sparkly uh, music. And it's dress up Hannah Montana, play with these digital dolls, whatever. I'm like, it's, it's sort of what it is. It demeans... Okay, not demean... But it pigeonholes girls into pink dressing up Hannah Montana and dolls which they're not people are real people and I think once people are parents or once you have like custody of a child and and you have to look after it then it's like well what would I how am I gonna mold this child right do I want them to grow up rounded yeah I do so I'm going to introduce them with all lots of stuff, like Lego, Barbies, because why not build a Lego house for your Barbie sort of thing? Yeah, I was I was definitely raised like that. I had access to all sorts of kinds of toys. My favorites were like Legos and Tinker Toys and remote control cars, but I did have Barbies on hand, and I sometimes asked for Barbies, but I just kind of played with whatever I wanted. And there are some parents that make a huge deal, like, oh, I'm going to make sure my boy plays with boy toys, or I'm going to make sure my girl plays with girl toys. That's sort of fading away, but it's still a thing. And I can't imagine how I would have turned out if I were like that, like in, actually encouraged to play with one toy or the other. 
Like they were all there, but I was. I know how I would be if I if I was brought up like that. I would think the same way. Uh, I think that part of the problem is that uh, a lot of parents are very afraid that their child is gonna be like not normal, like like oh I better make sure that my girl plays with with uh, dolls or else she's not gonna be normal. She's gonna be a tomboy or or oh no my boy doesn't play with. Uh, with toy cars and he likes, I don't know, he likes this toy or that toy, then no, no, he's gonna be weird or different. And uh, I think that there are a lot of parents who are very afraid of that. And that's, that's part of the reason why the same gender roles are still reinforced and, and uh, they, they keep existing because parents, uh, it's a kind of a vicious circle that keeps perpetuating itself. Like, Parents are afraid that a child is not going to be normal, so they force him to be normal. And this fear creates aggression against those who are not normal. So it, it all just feeds onto itself, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because you mentioned tomboy. Tomboy is seen, at least in the U.S., as kind of a positive term. Like, oh, that girl's a tomboy. She's really cute. She likes to play with boy stuff. But if a boy is really effeminate, then that scene is a very negative thing. So there's sort of this connotation that it's all right for either gender t and either gender to be masculine. But if the wrong gender is feminine, oh, that's wrong. That's not good. Like feminine, it's as that's, though femininity yeah. only belongs to women. That's a good point, actually. Um, I think. Well, it's because. Hmm. From my standpoint, I guess. Um, if you come from a household or a society where we're being, where, where, like, where the wrong sex being effeminate is, or, ah, uh, okay, if you're from a society where gay people are looked down on or pitied or not on the same level as straight people, then if you, then it doesn't matter who who is depicting those traits? If you are, then it'll be like, well, I I like you, man, but you're, be acting a little bit gay, and you're not going to say that to a child, as you'd with as you would with your friends. Uh, because, you know, that child is ten years old. You're not going to call them gay. That's bullying. Yeah, I, that's actually something that, uh, that's very discussed in the LGBT community and uh, we tend to, uh, we actually tend to disagree a lot between different parts of the community where, for example, masculine gay men are, are you know, they're, they're seen as like, oh, uh, everyone thinks we're effeminate or everyone thinks that being gay means being effeminate and uh, obviously the same on the other side, like feminine lesbians and uh, that's part of the big misconception that society has like if you, like you can't be a boy who is straight and who is still effeminate or uh, delicate that uh, you can't be, uh, well what Ilani says is true, it's that there is more leeway for women to be masculine but this is actually part of something that feminists uh, have pointed out that there is a denigration of the feminine, like that the feminine is seen as a bad thing and should be addressed. And I, I actually agree. I think I don't think that we should be uh, putting down uh, people who express feminine characteristics because it's it actually it's not going to to benefit anyone. It's it's only going to hurt uh, men who are effeminate and women who are effeminate and uh, gay people and straight people, and it ends up hurting everyone. And it's actually uh, a good uh, proof and it's evidence that sexism still exists. Like if everyone, um, a lot of people, especially on the escapist, say that, oh, sexism is over, we don't need feminism, and, uh, and all that. And no, actually, it still happens. If feminism uh, wasn't needed and sexism didn't exist, then a boy could be as effeminate as he as he wanted to be, and he would have no repercussions, and that is obviously not true. It's because the escapist is pretty uh, liberal, and by that I mean liberal. Um, uh, but as an experiment, uh, 
if you watch any any show with gay people on it, like or that is to say, very effeminate, played out gay people, uh, like fashion shows, like like in the back of my mind, I think, actually no, I don't watch that TV, but in the back of in the back of people's minds, they think, well, what? They're just acting stupid. What? What's up with that? Yeah, a lot of that is actually kind of what what uh, a debate in the LGBT community, and uh, there's a lot of uh, fighting between like, uh, oh no, you are hurting the the, the, the popular the, the the way that society sees us, and no, you don't let me express myself and, and all that, and it's actually kind of a very heated argument and it tends to be it, it's also tied with gender roles and uh, feminist uh, conceptions and it's actually a pretty big big topic but yeah I, I think that that tends to influence the way people uh, the way people uh, raise their children like they see those shows and see oh I don't want my son to turn out like that and that tends to create more harm than, than it solves. And yeah, I think I that feel it's like, sorry, Calvin, time I need, to... I want to say one more thing. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. It'll be quick. Um, I just want to say, I don't feel like the LGBT community should feel like they need to censor themselves in any way. Like, if society, or when society accepts gay people, they need to just be ready to accept the good, the bad, and the ugly. There are some obnoxious gay people, but there are also obnoxious straight people. So to act like that you need to put your best foot forward, like, I don't feel like that should be necessary. Once society is ready, they'll just accept the good, the bad, and the ugly. Absolutely. And on that, I do believe it is time to end this cast. I think the participants, if they were really nice, it was nice talking with you. It was fun. It was educational for me as well. So thank you for participating. And I hope that... And I do hope the listeners had some fun as well. And I already have a new project in the making. It will be an LGBT cast, which is why I cut you off right now, because that's, the, that's for another cast to discuss. <laughs>